Would you take your Bible this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5. As we work our way through the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached, we look at some very sensitive and difficult issues. And today we're looking at what the Bible says about divorce and remarriage in Matthew chapter 5. I heard this week the story of a couple who had been married for 50 years and had fought like cats and dogs the entire 50 years of their marriage. One day, the woman just said to her husband, you know, we just can't keep this going. We just can't do this anymore. I have decided that I'm going to pray every day and ask God to solve this problem by taking one of us to heaven so the other one can see a little bit of peace. And she said, when he answers my prayer, I've already made up my mind that I'm going to sell the house and move in with my sister. <clears throat> now, nobody can deny that a good marriage takes a lot of hard work. The issues of marriage and divorce affect so many people today, and divorce is prevalent in our nation. In fact, the divorce rate in America is among the highest in the world today, one out of two marriages in America end in divorce. For second marriages, that percentage increases to 65, 67% of second marriages end in divorce. And third marriages, the percentage goes even higher. 74% of third marriages in America end in divorce. And divorce is very expensive. Recent statistics indicate that the average divorce in the United States costs between $13,000 and $17,000. Divorce is costly and it hurts. Someone said divorce is worse than the death of a spouse because there's finality in death but not in a divorce. And a lot of people, a lot of Christian people, a lot of church people, a lot of people here today have experienced the excruciating pain and hurt of divorce. And I want to say to you right up front as we work our way through the teachings of Scripture that God loves you. God knows about your situation. God understands what you've been through and what you're going through. And that's one of the reasons that Jesus so very candidly and clearly addressed this issue in His Sermon on the Mount. When we hurt, He hurts. He does not want to see any of us have to experience the pain and the loneliness of divorce. So Jesus reminds us that marriage was ordained of God. It was meant to be special. It was not intended to be broken apart by divorce. It's interesting that just like in our day, divorce was rampant in the day of Jesus, maybe even more so in the day of Jesus than today. In fact, the Jewish historians of Jesus' day wrote about that day and divorce and wrote that many of the Pharisees and scribes gave their wives divorces, certificates of divorcement because of things that they just didn't like, even something as simply simple as, as burning a meal. They would threaten their wives with divorce. So during the days of Jesus Christ, divorce was used almost as emotional abuse or as mental abuse. You see, they would take the Old Testament law of Moses regarding divorce and they twisted it around <clears throat> to use it for their own selfish purposes. And in Matthew 5, Jesus set the record straight. Jesus took the Old Testament teaching, He amplified it, He clarified it, and He set the record straight about what the Bible teaches about this sensitive subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. So that's what we're dealing with today. And I want you to listen with an open mind and an open heart. Some of you have already experienced a divorce. Some in this room this morning may be contemplating a divorce right now. You may not have said anything to your spouse about it, but you've, you've thought about it. And there are a lot of young people here in our services today that are going to get married one day, and they need to know what God says about it and what God expects. 
So we're looking at what the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. These are the words of Jesus Christ. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 5 and stand together to honor God and to thank Him for His inerrant word. And we begin in verse 31. And we're going to be walking through several different passages of Scripture this morning. Jesus said, Furthermore, it has been said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these plain spoken words of Jesus Christ. And we ask you to teach us this morning exactly what your word says about this subject. Lord, we pray that you would give us open minds and open hearts to hear and to understand. And oh Lord God, we pray for those in our midst, those in our families who have gone through the agony of divorce. We pray today that as we look at the Word of God, that not only would we be clear what you say, but we would also be comforted by your grace. We thank you, God, for being a plain spoken holy God because you love us. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said, Amen. Be seated. There are a lot of confusing and conflicting ideals today about what the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. Even many churches and church leaders have no clear understanding of what the Bible really says about this subject. In fact, oftentimes in church life today, the truth of Scripture is obscured by the tradition of man or the tradition of the church. There are four basic views that the church has taken on the subject of divorce across the years. You could walk into any church in America today and find one of these four views. Different pastors teach these different four views. Some interpret the Bible to, to teach each of these four views. Now, there's only one view in Scripture, and I'm going to show you what that is. Jesus wrote it. Jesus dealt with it. But there are four views today that are, are very uh, common in the church, and one view is the most stringent view. It is the view that divorce is not allowable under any circumstance for any reason. There are some churches that hold to that view. The other view is on the other end of the spectrum. It's a very liberal view. It argues that marriage and divorce are allowable for any reason and under any circumstance. The other two views are, are somewhere in between those two extremes. One is that divorce is allowable under certain circumstances, but remarriage is never acceptable. The other view is that both Divorce and remarriage are allowed under certain circumstances. With all the confusion, even in the church, with those four views prevalent among God's people, what does Jesus Christ say about this issue? What does the Bible teach about divorce and remarriage? What are we to believe? Listen. We have to find out exactly what God says about it. It is not human opinion that matters. It is not personal preference. It is not church tradition. It is not the culture. It is what God says about it that is important. If you are a believer, this is our authority. Amen? And the truth is, the Bible actually teaches only one of these four views. And that is the one Jesus teaches here in, in Matthew chapter 5, in the fifth chapter of Matthew. But many people today, just like in the, the day of Jesus, and particularly like the scribes and Pharisees, have developed their own standards for divorce and remarriage, and they take their own standards and impose them on other people and teach them as God's standards. 
We need to be clear. We need to understand precisely and exactly what the Bible has to say about this issue. There are three places in the New Testament that speaks to divorce and remarriage. And I want you to jot them down. The first is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The second is in Matthew chapter 19. And the third is our text today in Matthew chapter 5. And there are many passages in the Old Testament about divorce and remarriage. And we're going to look at the three major principles that the Bible teaches about this subject this morning. And then I just want to talk to you for a few minutes out of my heart as a pastor to his people, as a shepherd to his sheep about this subject. But there are three principles that I want you to see right from the Word of God. Turn back to the very beginning of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and here we find the very first principle. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. It is unmistakably clear. Genesis 2, 24 says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The word join there, circle it if you don't mind marking your Bible. It is translated from a word that means to be glued together. So look at that verse. God saying, a man shall leave his father and mother and be glued together with his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So what's this principle? What's God teaching us? Here's what the Bible is saying. God intended marriage to be a lasting relationship. God intended marriage to be a lasting relationship. The Bible's teaching on divorce cannot be understood apart from the Bible's teaching on marriage. Marriage was God's plan, by the way, not man's. Before God ever instituted the church, God instituted marriage. God performed the first wedding ceremony. And we see from this passage in Genesis that in the very beginning, God intended for marriage to be a lifelong, lasting relationship between one man and one woman. One Bible commentator I read in preparing for this message said that divorce is like a person cutting off their arm or their leg because they have a splinter in it. Now, he was not making light of divorce. He was simply saying, instead of dealing with the trouble that arises between a husband and wife, we often try to solve the problem by destroying the union that has been made by the Spirit of God Himself. And the seriousness of that is seen in Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, 6, Jesus said, What God has joined together, what God has glued together, let no man separate. Then I want you to turn for a moment to the book of Romans in the New Testament. Romans chapter 7. And look at what God teaches us about marriage in Romans 7, beginning in verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, there are a few Bibles for you. This is a Bible-believing church. It's a Bible-teaching church. We use our Bibles here. And we invite you to do that too. In fact, if you have your Bible, hold it up and let me see it. God bless you. I see all of you over in that contemporary service holding your Bibles up. You can't, you, you didn't know I could see you, did you? And all of us over here, we can see you over there. Did you know that? Did you know, I'm getting off track here, but they've got over 150 people over there this morning worshiping the Lord. Would you thank the Lord for them and Him? We had, uh, somebody told me we had 220 people in our 9 o'clock service, and we've never had that many people in that service. So God is blessing, and I'm so very humbled and thankful for the blessings of God that we are experiencing. But look at Romans 7. Scripture says, Do you not know, brethren, so he's talking to, to believers, Do you not know that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. 
But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. What's that saying? God intended marriage to be a lasting relationship. Can you say amen? amen? Principle number one. Now turn to the last book in the Old Testament. We looked at the book of Genesis, the first book. Now turn to the last book, the book of Malachi. And here we see a second principle about these issues of divorce and remarriage. Malachi chapter 2. And look at verse 16. Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. It's very clear what God says in His Word. For the Lord God of Israel says that He hates divorce. I mean, that's pretty clear. So what's the second principle? God hates divorce. That's what He says. You know why God hates divorce? Two reasons. God hates divorce because it violates His design, His original intention for marriage, which was to be a lifelong lasting relationship. And God hates divorce because He knows the hurt and the pain and the agony that it causes His people to go through. God loves us. And God loves divorced people. And God hates divorce because of the pain and the turmoil and the trauma that it inflicts on the people who have to go through divorce. So get these principles fixed in your mind. Number one, God intended marriage to be a lasting relationship. Number two, God hates divorce. Then turn over, well, let me give you two places. Turn to Matthew 19. And turn also to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 24. Matthew 19 and Deuteronomy chapter 24. Let me kind of set the stage for Matthew 19. Jesus is teaching and the uh, Pharisees and the scribes come to Jesus and they're testing Him. And so they ask Him a question. You see, there were two schools of thought in the day of Jesus about divorce and remarriage. And the Pharisees were kind of trying to back Jesus into a corner here in front of the people. There, there were two schools of thought. One took Deuteronomy 24 and interpreted this passage in the Old Testament to mean that divorce was only permissible if the spouse was proven to be guilty of uncleanness or sexual immorality. Look at Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. When a man takes a wife and marries her and happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. So there was one school of thought in the day of Jesus that what this means in Deuteronomy 24 was that divorce was only permissible when there had been uncleanness, specifically sexual immorality. But there was another school of thought in Jesus' day. And it was also based off of an interpretation of Deuteronomy 24. It said that a man could divorce his wife for any reason whatsoever as long as he gave her a certificate of divorcement. So the Pharisees are talking to Jesus. And, and the people knew this law in Deuteronomy 24. And so they're saying, Jesus, which is it? Which interpretation is right? Well, they're trying to back Jesus in a corner because whatever He says, somebody's going to be upset. But you know that never stopped Jesus from telling the truth. Amen? He wasn't concerned about people being upset. He was more concerned about people knowing the truth and living by the truth. And so look at what Jesus said. In fact, here's the third principle. God allows divorce for two reasons only. God allows divorce for two reasons only. And that's it. Now I want to show you this in the Word of God. And there again, I want to remind you as we walk through these verses to keep your mind open. And don't form your opinion based on culture. Don't form your opinion based on church tradition. Don't form your opinion based on anything other than what God says in His Word. God allows divorce for two reasons only. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. 
Look at what Jesus said. Matthew 5, verse 31. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. You say, boy, Ed, I don't like that. I didn't write it. Jesus said it. Amen? Amen. Now, here's what he's saying. If a Christian is married to a Christian and one of them is sexually immoral and will not repent, then their immorality and their unwillingness to repent is a biblically justifiable reason for divorce that God will recognize. Jesus never advocates divorce. Nowhere does the Bible demand it. However, He specifically states in this passage of Scripture that divorce is permissible on the basis of sexual immorality when the innocent party has made every effort to maintain the marriage and there has been sexual immorality where the person will not repent. Then Jesus said in that particular circumstance, divorce is permissible. He does not say you have to get a divorce. He hates divorce, but he's saying in that circumstance, it is permissible. Uh, There are many couples where a spouse had been guilty of sexual immorality, and that spouse genuinely repented and had been forgiven by God and had been forgiven by the other person and by their spouse. And after a time of healing, their marriage went on to become what God intended it to be. And there is nothing more difficult to overcome in a marriage than the sin of infidelity, but it can be done if there is a willingness to forgive and a willingness to repent, then the marriage can be restored. Yet the Bible is clear. In a Christian marriage where there is sexual immorality without repentance or where there is sexual immorality that is repeated, The innocent person is released from the marriage vows made before God, and that person may end the marriage relationship. If you understand that, say amen. That's what Jesus is saying. Look at Matthew 19, verse 9. Matthew 19, 9. And here Jesus specifically addresses the issue of remarriage. Can a divorced person Remarry. Can a divorced person whose spouse committed sexual immorality remarry? Well, look at what Jesus said about it. Matthew 19, 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Now, I want you to look at this very carefully. Jesus does not prohibit the innocent party from divorcing an unrepentant, sexually immoral spouse. And he also makes it clear here that the one committing sexual immorality may not marry again without committing adultery. But no way, in no way does he restrict or prohibit the innocent party from marrying again. These are difficult issues. But this is exactly what Jesus is teaching. Can you say amen? So what's he saying? He's saying that divorce is biblically justified if there is adultery involved. Adultery is one of the two biblical reasons that divorce is justifiable. If there is a sexually immoral believer who is the part, a spouse that will not repent, then the other spouse is free from those marriage vows and in the sight of God can marry again. But the one committing sexual, uh, sexual immorality is not to marry again, nor can they marry again without committing adultery, according to the Word of God. Here's the second reason. Turn, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And look at verses 12 through 13, 12, 13, and 15. 
the word of God says, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. If any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. What's that talking about? Abandonment. Abandonment. The Bible is saying that if an unbelieving spouse abandons a believing spouse and will not repent, will not come back, then it is biblically justifiable for that divorce to take place. So there are only two times in Scripture when the Bible teaches that a divorce is justified, that is adultery and abandonment. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 19, 6, what God has joined together, what He's glued together, let not man separate. So here are three principles from the Word of God. Number one, God intended marriage to be a lasting relationship. Number two, God hates divorce because of what it does and the pain it causes to individuals who experience it. And three, God allows divorce for two reasons only, adultery and abandonment. Now, I want to take some time this morning and just talk to you a little bit as a pastor to his people, as a shepherd to his sheep. I want to talk to you from my heart about this subject because I know that many people here have experienced a divorce. And I know it's something that we all have to struggle with. All of our families have been touched by it somewhere down the line. The first thing I want to say to you is this. If you have experienced a divorce that is not biblically justifiable, if you have experienced a divorce and there was no adultery or no abandonment, it was sin, but you remember God loves you. God loves you. The truth is all of us are sinners. All of us have sinned. Now that statement is not a license for us to sin or an encouragement for us to live outside the parameters of God's Word. It is simply a commentary on the grace and mercy of God. God loves you. He loves you. And God is willing to forgive. So what are you to do? If you've been through a divorce and and it was not biblically justifiable if there was no adultery or if there was no abandonment. What are you to do? The first thing to do is to repent. Just ask God to forgive you. Just repent. Repentance means we turn from our sin. And we seek the forgiveness of God. Genuinely, humbly, confess to God that you messed up. Just tell God about it and ask Him to forgive you. He loves you and He will forgive you. All of us live with the consequences of our decisions, but God is always ready and willing to forgive. And some of you today have carried guilt and shame and heartache for year after year because of an ugly divorce, and today God will set you free. Today, God will forgive you if you will come to Him in repentance. Now, I'm always asked this question. Well, if you're not biblically divorced and you've been remarried and you repent, does that mean that you have to dissolve your marriage? I like what Billy Graham said about that. He said, you can't unscramble scrambled eggs. The answer is no. The answer is no. What's done is done. God forgives us when we genuinely confess and repent and we move on from there. In fact, I want to give you a passage of Scripture. I don't have time to read it, but I want to ask you to jot it down. If you're in this situation or circumstance, I think it will give you encouragement. And that's 1 Corinthians 7, 16 through 24. Just read it this afternoon. Second, I want to say a word this morning to parents who may be here and you're contemplating divorce. Think before you get a divorce. Think about that. The price you pay will be much higher 
than you can afford. There are secular studies that indicate that parents are not really the victims that are affected the most, even though they're affected very much, but the children are affected by divorce. Secular statistics, not, I'm not talking about church statistics or Christian statistics, but secular statistics teach us that children of divorced parents have a tendency to have less confidence in their ability to relate to the opposite sex and a higher rate of delinquency. But I want to say something to you children. If you're in a divorce situation, that does not have to be you because God's grace is always sufficient. God's grace is always sufficient to help you and to help you overcome the odds. And God will do that for you if you live for Him. It has been my observation through more than 30 years of ministry that if two people are sincerely honest with each other and they are willing to humble themselves before God and seek help, that they can work out their problems, whatever those problems may be. Third, I want to say something to those of you who are married. Those of you who are married, do everything you can to build a strong family. Do everything you can to build a strong marriage. And here's one of the things that you can do. I encourage you with all my heart to get involved in Sunday school or life groups because every married couple needs to have around them a couple other couples that they can network with who can come alongside of them when they are hurting and say, we love you, we're praying for you, and we know what you're going through because we've experienced some of that ourselves. You're not going to get that sitting in a worship service with 800 people. But you'll get it in a small group. Strengthen your marriage. Do everything possible that you can to make your marriage strong. Work at it day by day. And let me say this to you. If you have a good marriage, you ought to be thankful to God for it. Don't take it for granted. If you have a good marriage, keep it up. Keep working at it. And don't look down your nose at a person who is divorced if you have a good marriage because pride goes before a fall. And it could happen to you. It could happen to you. Fourth, I want to say a word to the church, to, to, to those of you who have a marriage in trouble. If you're having problems in your marriage, don't be afraid or ashamed or embarrassed to come and talk to one of our pastors about it. We love you. We would never judge you. We are here to help you. But you have to come and let us help you. And we will help you. And we will help you find the Christian counseling that you need to help you go through what you're going through. Fourth, I want to say a word to the church. Church, we are called of God to take a biblical stand on these issues of divorce and remarriage. Let the world see what Jesus Christ teaches and what the Word of God says People today need to know the truth. And don't compromise the truth just because somebody is not going to like you. As a church, God has called us to minister to people who are hurting, and that includes divorce. A divorce is like a death. People that have been through divorce have said to me, Pastor, it's actually worse than a death because in death, people gather around you. But in divorce, people have a tendency to back away from you and isolate you. And the plight of divorce is one of the heartaches and trauma that many people go through. The church is called to help people. We are a hospital for the wounded. We're an intensive care unit for broken hearts. There's no excuse for a child of God to look down their nose at another child of God because of divorce. And I want to say a word to our young people. If you're planning on getting married one day, you should only date a person that would make a good mate because it's about 100% that you're going to marry somebody you date. 
and you need to make wise choices. How do you make wise choices? Well, young people, you need to really talk to God about it. You need to pray about who you're going to date. And you need to talk to your parents about it. And you say, now you've gone to meddling, Ed. But you really do. They love you. Now, they might not always agree with you. I hope they don't. They've been around longer than you have. And they can impart some wisdom to you that maybe you've not thought about. But have an, an open relationship with your parents. Talk to your parents uh, about your dates. Good advice leads to good decisions. In fact, parents, listen. Any dating that your children do should be wide open and transparent. Children ought to talk freely to their parents and openly about dating relationships. And this is one area where there should be complete transparency. It is a place where there should be no secrets. in here. I don't know how it is over there. <laughs> I want to say something else to you young folks because I love you. Don't you even consider dating somebody who's not a vibrant Christian. I'm not talking about somebody who's joined the church and been baptized. I'm talking about somebody who is in love with Jesus who knows Jesus, who walks the walk, who talks the talk, who is vibrant in their faith and their testimony for the Lord Jesus. The Bible says we're not to enter a relationship with an unbeliever. Believers shouldn't date unbelievers. And certainly believers shouldn't marry unbelievers. That's in the book of Corinthians. So my encouragement to you young folks would be not even to date somebody who is not a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because if you do, you're going to regret it somewhere down the road. Never date somebody that you couldn't marry if you fell in love with them. You marry an unsaved person, you're going to have the devil for a father-in-law. I want you to hear me. I want you to listen. I told this in the first service, so I'll probably tell it now, just lighten it up a little bit. But uh, my kids grew up here. And my daughter's first date uh, was not a pleasant time for me. <laughs> it, it, it was, it's not for any daddy, really. Is it? Dad's? Can I get a testimony? Some of you are fixing to find out. <laughs> and uh, she had a date with some young man. I don't even remember his name. He was not affiliated with his church. I think he went to school with her or something at the time. And uh, So I knew he was coming to pick her up. And Erica was at my house helping her get ready. And also uh, Allison uh, was there. I'd forgotten about that. Allison reminded me. Allison Patton was there. And they were helping Amber get ready for this date. And, and I thought, boy, this would be a great time for me to clean my guns. <laughs> <laughs> Bad as I hate to tell you this, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and I had, I had my gun out and guns laying around all around my chair and this 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 kid came in well when he when he rang the doorbell I didn't go to the door and I don't know who let him in but he came in and when he walked in there where I was I said sit down I was cleaning my gun Allison reminded me of this I forgot about it but she said I had a machete or a knife out there too looking at it I, I had forgotten that but I'll never forget the look on his face when uh, I kind of looked at him through the barrel of that gun. <laughs> and his eyes just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I said, now, are you going to be back on time? He said, yes, sir. And I said, that's, that's not five minutes late. I said, that's on time. He had her home early. <laughs> I don't even know why I told you that. But <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is, Parents, it's your business who your children date. They might not like that, but it's your business who they date. 
And you need to be involved in that. And young people, you need to let them be involved in that. Finally, I'm talking today to some adult or or some teen that you're in a sexually immoral relationship. And I want to say to you, stop it. Stop it today. Stop it right now. You are on a narrow road that is going to lead you to a lot of guilt and shame and heartache. And it is going to take you away from God. Stop it. And immediately confess it to the Lord. And restore your relationship with Him. And talk with one of our pastors or a Christian counselor. And determine the next steps for healing and restoration. Folks, listen to me and I'm finished. I preach this message today because I love you. But more important than that, God loves you. It is His Word to you and to me. God is the Creator of all of us. God is the Creator of marriage itself. He is the one who laid out this plan that marriage is to be a lifelong, lasting relationship. God's design is always best. And when we stray from His plan, the results are always painful. In the Bible, we find God's statement on every matter. When we come to the subject of divorce, we have to find out what He says. Not human opinion, not the standards of the culture, not contemporary society. It is the opinion of God that matters because when we live within the parameters of this book, we experience His blessing. And when we step outside the parameters of this book, as much as He wants to bless us, He cannot. Because God never blesses disobedience. So let's take His Word to heart. Let's live by it. In our homes. In our marriages. Let's live by God's Word. And all of God's people said, I'm going to ask you to stand and bow your head and close your eyes. All over this room and all over the other room in the kids' zone. Just stand right now and close your eyes. I'm going to ask in a moment that parents and husbands and wives and children who value your relationship with each other and value your relationship and walk with God, I want to invite you to publicly come this morning and get on your knees before the Lord and pray for your home and pray for your marriage. And maybe you're the only one here. You come and pray for whatever situation you are in. Maybe you're going through a divorce and God loves you and you come and pray. Maybe you found this morning that your divorce was not biblically justified and God is here to forgive you and to set you free. You come and let Him do that this morning. And the place to start is a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't know Him, you need to open your heart to receive Christ today, to let Him forgive your sin, to enter into a relationship with Him that cost Him His life on the cross and He died there for you. And so you come. And tell one of our pastors that today you're coming to receive Jesus. And, and then there are those and you're visiting this church and you've been praying about belonging to a, a church home and finding a church home. Every home needs a church home in a Bible-believing church where the Word of God is taught without compromise. Whether it's here or somewhere else, I encourage you to get in that kind of church. And today, if the Spirit of God is leading you to be part of this church family, you step out and you come. You walk forward in here. You walk forward in the kids' zone. You make these decisions. I'm going to pray. Our pastors are going to be here. Families, I'm going to ask you not to hesitate or flinch or wait. You come and you talk to the Lord. God in heaven. Aside from our relationship with you, the most precious thing we have is our family. And we pray that you will set families free today from bondage that Satan has had some of them under for years and years. I pray, God, today that there would be forgiveness and restoration and healing and blessing and strengthening. And God, some are coming to pray for wayward children. And I pray you hear their prayers and do miracles 
even before this week is out. God, all we can do is come to you and humble ourselves and pray. Hear our prayers, O God, and God's people said. You come right now as we sing.